Impro Theater and the cast and crew of this online performance would like to take this time to honor the indigenous peoples of the ancestral and unceded homelands we each inhabit and to consider the legacy of colonization and its far-reaching effects. So, uh, Diana, you'll, you'll be off screen at the beginning, and I'll introduce okay, cool. you. No, you don't have to turn off. Don't don't turn off the camera. Oh, okay. You'll be just so you know. I'll say it. I'll. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, and we're very excited about tonight's Impro Talk. I'm your host, Mike Rock. We have Diana Elizabeth Jordan joining us in a minute. But first, a couple of announcements. At three o'clock tomorrow, Jane Austen Unscripted, and uh, that also has an amazing cast. So a lot of great shows for you to catch, and they continue next weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome to Impro Talk, Diana Elizabeth Jordan. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it is absolutely my pleasure and our delight to have you. Diana. Um, so uh, how did you find out about uh, impro and, and the Shakespeare class? Well, and I'm going to do a brief audio description. Oh, so forgive myself. me. Yes. I was like, you oh, you taught me. You taught me I this. Taught you. I taught you. I forgot to do it. That's okay. Um, I have an audio description as uh, a way to describe myself. So if anyone in the audience um, has a visual impairment, so you can see that I'm an African American woman. I have um, short curly hair and I'm wearing a red flowered dress and a silver necklace with a ball on it that was given to me by my, my best friend, Paul. So, and I just pulled it apart. <laughs> I <laughs> am a, a Caucasian man of Irish heritage. So that's my coloring, salt and pepper hair, a fresh haircut. Uh, wearing a uh, uh, off-white slash light blue shirt with red stripes and a gray necktie cinched at the top. Um, that's who I am and what I look like. I don't have any special jewelry from anybody. You look, that was really good, Mike. Good job, A+. Plus. Thank you April so much. Them, um, I, just so people know, I recently took a workshop, Diana Elizabeth Jordan brought a workshop to uh, the faculty of Impro Theater School. And among the things that she helped us to understand and to put into practice, and I've, I kind of uh, didn't do right away tonight, was when you start something, um, a performance online, uh, particularly like this, um, to do an audio description 
of who you are so that the audience who may be visually impaired or just listening can know whose voice uh, they're hearing. And again, it, you know, it's something that in a way that we had to get used to our new normal, I think, thing that you're not used to, you had to put into practice. So sometimes I need to remember too. So again, it's not, but that was really good, Mike. So A plus, <laughs> A plus for my workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so tell us how uh, you found out about Impro and or the Shakespeare workout class. So I was, um, as you know, last year when everything kind of shut down and it was, very challenging time for all of us. Um, where I work, I work at Performing Arts Studio Bus, so I teach, um, I work with actors with primarily development with disabilities. So we went completely online. With me, I, so I make four new classes every week. Um, that's what I've been doing for the past year. But I needed something for myself to be creative. I wasn't going out to I wasn't going out at all. Right. And I I think it was an email or something that said improvising Shakespeare. And I went, huh. But because I mean I love Shakespeare. I mean Bill was my guy, Bill Ross. <laughs> so I was like, this might be kind of cool and really, really interesting. And what what would that event look like? So I signed up for Brian's class and it was not only was the class amazing, I didn't realize how much, because at that time, even to connect with people once a week was so important because I felt so isolated. And it was turned out that between the time right around the death of George Floyd and everything that was going on, it kind of felt like the world was imploding outside. And um, just because of the work I do in terms of advocacy and being an activist, it became very emotionally challenging. And so really being able to come once a week and improvise Shakespeare and, and combine two things I love, improvisation and Shakespeare, it, as I said, it really had such a profound effect. I mean, not only as an artist, but was emotionally necessary to get me through something that we had no idea. I mean, it's been a year now, but in May and April, and I think it was the class late April, May, everything was like, what? What is this? And Things that were being said politically at that time by the administration. The guy at my not a nice guy at that. So the not nice guy was saying a lot of stuff. And I really needed it in both ways. I needed it as a creative outlet, um, artistically, and I really needed it as an emotional outlet and that led to me taking the class with Mags off um, in the heart and starting to work with the improv and working with Tatiana. So really, I mean, it was the best decision I ever made because I've had, it, it allowed me to do a lot more things creatively than last year at this time. I was like, oh my God, how am I, what am I gonna do? <laughs> How am I gonna create? How is it gonna work? I, I would imagine that, like so many of us who felt, um, you know, obviously cut off from friends and family and and socializing and et cetera, for for creative people, for performing arts people, um, it's you know, it is it is a particularly challenging experience. And for you, working with uh, persons of various disabilities in the arts. Um, for a lot of your students, a lot of your um, uh, people that you that you work with, it, it must have been incredibly disruptive. Uh, even, it, yeah, it it really was. I mean, I think what I love about where I work is because we all are working artists. I mean, we're not none of us are people who kind of 
giving up the career and they're falling back on teaching. We are all artists. We are all actively pursuing artistic career. And the, nothing wrong with being a teacher from that, like in that, but I'm an artist educator. I am a working artist who also loves the teacher that I'm sure the info staff that is for the most part. So, but I think for a lot of our guys who are used to a routine of coming to our program and seeing each other all the time, and now we're online and we were all trying to figure out how do we shift technically to this virtual program. So we were learning about the seat of our pants. I mean, uh, it was a learning, huge learning curve for everybody. Right. And so, you know, we do connect. We do connect with our students on a regular basis. We, we teach a lot of Zoom class, each of the teachers, um, each of the staff every week, every, so we are connecting more. But yeah, it was, because there were a lot of, when are we coming back, Diana? When are we coming back? But, and, and we just didn't, and so don't have that. And I, I don't think anyone had any idea it would be this long. I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe Jim, I, I remember this. I have two friends who, my kind of, my girl, you know, when we would get together for coffee often before the whole thing, you know, Went down. Uh, imploded. So we would get together on Zoom. And I remember last April, my, my friend Anne's birthday, and we said, okay, probably by June, my birthday, June 3rd, in case you're wondering, probably my <laughs> birthday. And my aunt has the flowers in. <laughs> probably by June 3rd, maybe we'll be back together in person. And my friend Kimberly's birthday is in August. We're like, Oh, maybe by August, and now we realize probably we can, it may not be till August. This again. year. Yeah, this year when we, because um, we're probably going to wait till we're all vaccinated. So, no, but no, no, no one ever thought it would be the song. And, and to say again, that my students, we continue to say, I don't know, because sometimes the first question is, when are we all getting back together? And the truth is, we don't know, we don't know when we get back, how we're going to come back together, because it may be different for safety. And so there's still a lot of unanswered questions that you can't answer. It's really hard not to give someone an answer that they feel desperately want and to say, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's my answer. I don't know. Yeah, it's um, it's it's frustrating for everybody, and and particularly for an at risk community and or uh, a community who are already struggling with you know challenges to to stay connected to people. And um, man, I hope these vaccines take care of all the all the issues, all the variants, and all the other stuff that we're hearing but, but about. I will say, there's a group of our guys who are connected on Facebook. And they are, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, like working on other stuff. And we have love and like, I can't, and they're like, good night, see you tomorrow. I'm like, oh my God, do you guys like never go to bed? And I'm like, oh, I, um, I never go to bed either. But <laughs> so they're connecting. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I have so many things I was, I was showing, I showed Diana my notes I mean, that you, I. You, you know more about me by now than I know. Um, about but let me just, I'm going to just do some, I want to just do some highlights real okay. quick for our audience. And then, okay. and then we'll kind of dig into some stuff. So um, uh, actor, producer, director, um, solo artist, um, uh, a, a disability influencer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Diana has done up, uh, upward more than sixty uh, theater product, like plays, theater productions, um, uh, film shorts, um, full length films, TV episodes, uh, one woman show, um, uh, and uh, has been featured in um, at least one book that I know of. Um, 
has served on uh, Women of Color Unite as a disabled advocate, um, SAG-AFTRA uh, Committee for uh, Performers with Disabilities, the National uh, Dis Disab uh, National Board for uh, Disabled, sorry, Advisory Board for National Disabled Theater. Is that how you say it? Sorry. The National Disability Theater. Disability yeah. Theater. Um, uh, so many, I mean, okay, so, um, Let's 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 pick one thing. You, ha you in 2015, you start a company called the Rainbow Butterfly Cafe, right? And um, you call it an edutainment company, which I love. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, I think the first time I heard edutainment was um, uh, the N United States of Hip Hop album in the middle 80s. Um, Anyway, edutainment, it's a, it's a great, I love that phrase. I love right. be, because you are entertaining, you are an entertainer, and you also mm -hmm. are an amazing educator. Um, right. But your tagline for Rainbow Butterfly Cafe is eradicating ableism, racism, and other stigmas uh, and celebrating the disability experience. Right. T tell us how it came about that you said, you know what, I'm going to start, I'm going to start this company. I'm going to. Oh. Sure. Um, at, at the, there, there were several things that um, at the time, at my current job, there was a, a boss who is no longer there who was, and I say it, it was a not great situation. He was sometimes really abusive. It was really hard. He is no longer there. The boss, the guy there now is awesome and the there were two people there, but the one that was abusive and verbally abusive is no longer there. So I just want to emphasize it. Not, so that was part of it. So I was, I was being broken down. I mean, it was a place where it got hard to get up to go to work every day. And it was really sad because it was something I loved to do, but emotionally it was hard. And I thought, you know, I need to start my own what do I want that to be? And I've ever kind of thought about what it would be like to have my own business. So I was looking for other work because I wanted to be where I was at the time because of this other person. Um, and I was, I, and I was like, oh my gosh, art education, I'm a black woman with a disability, this is gonna, and they're gonna put my resume out there and then they're gonna be like, oh, yeah, I have had to turn down all <laughs> And I, it was like, nobody seemed to be, and there wasn't a lot of what I thought would be interesting. Maybe that was my own ego in the way, but, um, and then I thought, well, I could really kind of start my own thing where I could really do what, I wanted to do, which was to have the thing that would allow me to do everything I love to do, what I love to do. I love to perform, I love to teach, I love the combination of, I never wanted to be a quote unquote classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I have educators in my family. My grandmothers are educated, my mom was an educator, um, and I can't say, but I wanted something a little bit different. So that was kind of the germ of it. And it kind of began to grow from there. I started to say, how can performance and entertainment and edutainment come together where I can lead a workshop where it's doing both, you know, using entertainment and using the arts and expressive arts to educate about something that I think is really important to me and and to give food for thought. And that I got the rainbow for my cafe because I know in two hours I'm not going to change the world in two hours. I mean I you yeah. know that I mean but if, like with the idea of description if I can give you the food for thought to think about something you maybe never thought of before. So that part of it with eradicating ableism is, and racism and other instinctness, of this, that to think, how can we reframe how we see disability? 
but disability you know, connects with every other, like, you know, I'm not black here, a woman here, and have my disability here. They all you know, connect as the disability you know, connect with every other group, every other marginalized group, every other group. So it's about how can I just give information that might help you reframe how we see disability and not the disability as this negative, sad, or as just a cultural identity, just as being African American, just as being from the LBGTQI community. How can we just see that as another identity that in another way people live their lives? You know, we, we all live our lives a certain way. And why can't disability not be seen in this? Oh, tragic thing someone has to overcome. But I think of the stigmas we need to overcome, not so much my disability. So which is, I, yes, go ahead. That, which is one of the main, one of my workshops that I offer. It's the, it's, it's overcoming the stigma that is applied to, to you, as opposed to you having to, you know, people thinking that you need to somehow overcome your own uh, uh, disability. Exactly, um, exactly. It's like, you know, and we only use that. When we, I mean, yes, I'm a woman, I'm African American, but no one's ever said to me, as soon as you overcome being black, well, that, that's not <laughs> incredible. As soon as you overcome the female thing, you know, <laughs> overcome your, your womanness. You know, so it, my my disability is just one. I have many identities. Disability is one of them. Yeah, I love the way you put that. There, it, this is a great segue, um, uh, Diana, into a book that you are featured in um, yeah. by uh, Liliana Moldovan. Yes. And I'm going to pronounce the title and then you're going to correct me. Um, I'm probably not because I don't really know. Because she's, it's originally, it's in, it's in Romanian, I believe. It's Romanian, yeah. Uh, Eroi Impossibiluli, I think. Is. <laughs> Heroes. <laughs> it's called Heroes of the Impossible. Uh, Liliana Moldovan. She's, she's an award-winning Romanian author. And, um, Diana, if you'll let me, I'll just, I'm just going to read a quick description of, of the sure, book. Sure. Uh, the, it's the first collection of interviews about the success stories of people with disabilities who have distinguished themselves by outstanding achievements in literature, art, sports, school, and entrepreneurship. The idea that the lives of people with disabilities should not be viewed as an uninterrupted series of tragedies and failures, but rather by looking at their achievements. The interviews in the book present the success stories of people with disabilities from around the world, people who have succeeded overcoming social and educational barriers, prejudices of all kinds, proving that they can transform the world we live in into a more friendly, more beautiful, and better one. That sounds like a pretty amazing book. It, it, well, and it was really great to read about the other artists. It was a few years ago, and it was, it's really funny because it's written in both Romanian and English. Thank goodness so I could actually know what was being said about me because I am not fluent <laughs> in Romania. And I was like, oh, you did good stuff after the interview. But it, it really, I mean, number one, if those things are an honor, you know, because when someone reaches out to you and says, I want to put you in a book that represents artists with disabilities from around the world, I mean, that's like, it's pretty you cool. Know, it's pretty cool for the from, from you know, from, from little me, that was a pretty cool moment. So um and let me did the interview. Um she emailed me, so I did it via um I never spoke to her, we always communicated via email and um you know, I, and I think it took a moment because I think it set my mind and you know, the deadline, I'm like, oh my God, so I got the deadline in. And a few months later, the package arrived at my um, doorstep and it was this, and what was really funny is when I picked it up, I saw the Romanian side first. 
and like well, and like Romanian hair while I'm on the net like I'm in a freaking little Romanian Merry Christmas <laughs> then, I, then I um I thought the English side so it was it was it was really cool um and again that this is really neat and it's with the blessing that come in life that you you don't imagine. I mean, that was not like on my book list. I wanted to be featured in a book around the world, people from around the world, but it was really lovely and nice. Yeah, it's one of those things that you can't you can't count on, you can't predict that it's gonna happen. But when it happens, you're like, oh, that's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean you're right, because again, like if that that as of all the things that my bucket list that that wasn't even a thought of, oh, I hope someone from Romania write the book and she call me and want me to be in her book. I mean, that, <laughs> but um, like I said, it was just really lovely. And hopefully, you know, my hope is there were other artists or other artists with disabilities who read that and, and, read about all of us and to see the path of possibility for themselves. And again, and I was excited by what she wrote, because it's really about the barrier that is the barriers of the society, the barriers of education that say, oh no, you can't you can't come to this program because or you can't train here because of your disability will know. The reason is because of the barrier that says we don't see a place for you. But that has nothing to do with one disability. That has to do with the educational barriers that we need to break down, those stigmas we need to break down to have more equity for all of us. That's such an important thing that people, you know, that just being reminded of that, uh, in your workshop and and um, you know a couple other places in the last year or two, remembering that language matters, and when when an organization or a business or a some sort of program or something says, well, we can't, you you, you can't be part of this thing because of your disability. That's the wrong language. The language is we aren't equipped to accommodate you because we haven't taken steps to accommodate you um and that's a that's a that's a big that's an important you know the first step for for organizations is acknowledging all right we got to make some changes in order to make ourselves accessible and make our program accessible and i know that our theater is you know uh, it has that same problem, you know. The, you know, we, we're we need to find a space that is accommodating, and um, uh, there's so many places and organizations and programs that need to reframe their thinking and say, "Listen, we what can we do to be accommodating and to be accessible, as opposed to just turning people away." And I just say the disposable income for people with disabilities, the disposable income is $490 billion. Now, none of that is my money, so don't, I don't have any of that money. But and I have maybe like $4 of that $490 billion. And the discretionary income is $21 billion, which is more than the like in the Latino community combined. And I say that because by not those architectural barriers of the system, by not reframing that, there's money that's being left on the table. By not having authentic representation of disability, um, by not having people be able to authentically see themselves. You know, we have a lot of the representation we have a disability or non-disabled actors. And I don't want to take away from saying Lewis or other actors, but yet, you know, the last year, Halle Berry said, I am not going to take this transgender female role because I'm not a transgender female. And everyone applauded her. Yet when it comes to disability, we're told, 
full of action. We get to do that. And we're actors. <laughs> yeah. And I'm an actor. Yes. It is that. And I'm an actor. And to me, it's like, well, if you say, well, you need a star, or you become a star because they have an opportunity. But if I don't get an opportunity to play someone who is just really specific, if I don't get an opportunity to play a non specific role, then I don't get opportunities. I've been very lucky if I'm using that as a general example. But yeah, we need, again, the authentic representation, 40, $490 billion is a lot yeah. of money. Yes, it is. I think, like I said, none of it is my money. I have, I, <laughs> Uber Eats, don't call me Uber Eats because I don't have $490 billion. But, you know, I can order a smoothie. It is. Uh, but yeah, I'll buy you a smoothie after my cooking a smoothie. But that would be real, real fun. I knew I knew that I knew that pressuring pressuring you into buying me a smoothie was was the point of this. That was the reason, uh, that, that's the reason I'm doing it in the mic is that like I said, okay, I'll do it and I'll buy you the smoothie you that you're in. <laughs> so there is an there's an organization that you're so good at making segues. Um there is an organization called the Rudiman Family Foundation. Mm -hmm. And um in 2020 in an interview last year in an interview, isn't it weird that 2020 is over? It just disappeared. Oh um, yeah. I, yeah, that was really funny because like people were like, I want to get rid of 2020. And I'm just like, well, you guys know like the day after it's not gonna go back to 2019. And I feel like, hey, yeah. over. It's like we're still gonna be in a pandemic. It's not like yeah. It's not like going back to normal on January 1st. But so yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh but in 2020, the year that yeah that actually did happen y'all yeah um, it did it really did for the rudderman family foundation um octavia spencer uh academy award winner was um was interviewed and mm -hmm. she said casting able-bodied people in roles for characters with disabilities is offensive unjust and deprives an entire community of people from opportunities nothing can replace the lived experience and authentic representation yeah um I Thank you, Octavia. Let's do a film. Let's do a film together. I'll give you my number after the after the interview. <laughs> but no, my my thing with Jim Bruno said disability is a lived experience, not a trained skill. And if you can make parallels, the paint downs and blackface, and I say parallels because that they started on a whole new. I mean, but there are parallels, and that's that, that they there are parallels. And yet it is again is offensive because disability again is a lived experience. And then what happens when you have someone a non-disabled actor is like you're still erasing the um you're still erasing disability as an authentically lived experience because of um for example, Tom Hanks plays someone who uses a wheelchair. We say, oh, well, he really doesn't use a wheelchair. It denies the existence that disability is a lived experience shared by one out of every four Americans in, in this country. We are the largest minority. We are the only minority group that you can become a part of. And you know, it never made sense to me when, you know, I remember there was a show on a few years ago, I won't, but they said um, it was about a computer um, a genius who was visually impaired. And I can't remember the show, but they said, oh, and we, we had it out and we had it out braille and everything like that. But it's like, if you're not willing to make the account make the legal accommodation for that actor so he can do his job. Why are you showing disability if you're not really showing disability? You wouldn't do that. I mean, there was an article years, a few years ago where someone wanted Julia Roberts to play Harriet Tubman. And I, it's true, I read it. And someone <laughs> oh said, 
Someone says, bro, no one really knows who her is half their world anyway. No, it never happened. And I would I would hope that if the alpha would made to Julia Roberts, she would have said no. But yeah. it's, but that idea of both of Cole playing Martin Luther King is ridiculous. Yeah. Everyone be up and down. So why why is it any more like at TV said it robs a community of talented artists who don't get the opportunity to tell their own stories. And the, the, you know, and other stories. I mean, disability are part of our story, but human experiences of, yeah. you know, I said once, the best two days of my life were the days my nephew was born. June 5th, 2007 and December 9th, 2010. It was the best day of my life. The worst day of my life, one of the worst days so far is when I came home, looked on my Facebook page, and found out my friend Danny committed suicide. Neither of the experience have anything to do with the fact that I have a disability, but they are human. You know, speaking at my friend Daniel's funeral would be, so far, the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. It's, it was excruciating and painful. What did my nephews grow up and I don't know if you had any business unless you think kids or kids. Watching your kids grow up is like this beautiful, painful, wonderful experience. But that's a human experience, you know? Yeah. So they're both they're both a part, they're both a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I I mean, just that that um uh, just that concept of looking at what is what we all have in common. Mm-hmm. as opposed to the difference celebrating differences right but appreciating what we have in common right. and and acknowledging and respecting right the 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 broad spectrum of human experience irrespective of right. uh, uh, of of the differences right. um and i was going to it's you read my mind because i was going to ask you if it is an apt comparison to blackface and in it's it's parallel, I, and I, I hate I hate to say it direct, and in a, in, a, in, a, in many ways it is it is in a way that I don't I think they're both inappropriate and offensive. Um, I think black people started to make fun of African Americans and to um the great. African American, I don't necessarily think "cripping up," as we called it, was started oh for the some re- for the same reason. That's why I can say they're parallel. But the offense now in twenty twenty or twenty from what what year is it? Twenty twenty one. It's twenty. Believe the, it or not. Uh, where did twenty twenty go, Mike? What the we've heck lost, happened? We've lost. We've lost it completely. What? Yeah, I think that's an important point that the the effect is the effect is this you've 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 taken an opportunity away and you've sort of said and as in, as you've said you've you've erased an an experience a, a lived experience by having a, a, a it, I guess you it might seem like splitting hairs to say um, Leonardo DiCaprio playing. Uh, the character that he played in uh, What's Eating Gilbert Grape or um, any of a number of other representations that we've seen, all of which seem to somehow win Academy Awards. Um, oh, yeah, that's that, 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 that another thing. But... It's, it's, it's not that they're, um, I think it, it, to interpret what you're saying, it's it's not necessarily that they're um, uh, making fun or, 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 right. or uh, something like that, but it is it does have the effect of, of uh, disrespecting and taking away uh, that opportunity of, of of sharing a lived experience. Well, and like you said, you know, if you're we get out of the capital, Brian Pants, and he recently did the outside other actors, they're also going to have other oppor- more opportunities. So how? 
How did Leonardo DiCaprio become Leonardo DiCaprio? He had opportunity. He ended up, I think, thinking with like, like growing pains and like when he was a kid, Brian Cranston went to the commercial for him or something like that. You had opportunities. So, um, and my other question is, if say Brian Cranston were offered the role of a judge in some movie, just a judge, are you going to consider an actor who uses a wheelchair for that role also? You should. But, you know, so again, yeah, it takes more opportunity to wait. And until I think we're speaking up about it more, but it is, those are the, those are the parallels and it's offensive. And then, like I said, so when do I get to work? If, I, if I'm not considered for the neighbor, and, and there's a role for someone with cerebral palsy, and you give it to Halle Berry so she can win another Academy Award. Nothing against Halle, I think she's amazing. We don't get opportunities to work. That hasn't said, I've had a lot of great opportunities. I'm very grateful. So I'm not bitter, I'm just honest. Yeah, I think that's a great distinction. I'm not <laughs> bitter, I'm bitter, just I'm honest. honest. <laughs> um, so 2.7% um, of characters in the highest earning movies in 2016 were depicted with disabilities. 2.7% mm -hmm. of characters were depicted with disabilities. In 2018, 2019 TV season, 2.1% of characters were depicted with disabilities. Um, we all know, the, the reason we know uh, certain people, certain actors, uh, is because they are exceptions to the rule. And unfortunately they get sometimes used as, well, look at RJ Mitty from Breaking right, Bad. Right. Look at Mika Fowler on Speechless. Look at right. Cole Sebus on Stumptown. Yeah. Uh, and down the line, um, characters with um, with Down syndrome, characters with cerebral palsy, right. um, uh, actors who are uh, who use a wheelchair because they had an accident, who right. had, uh, you know, et cetera. So we all know these exceptions, um, which is great for being able, for people being able to see themselves in right. projects. But if the if, but the numbers don't lie. And if the percentage of characters is 2.1%, we can, we need to do better. Oh, there, I mean, you know what? There are like 5,000 shows on right now. I mean, when you think about that, there, there are so many platforms I don't even know. I mean, how many shows are there? So if you, So many. Uh, yeah, I mean, like... You know what? I mean, like I said, every 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 day I'm like, oh, have you seen blah blah blah? Have you seen blah blah blah? So of all those shows, there are more opportunities. And again, when we when we come to disability, the diversity too, because you know, you got Micah and, and um, RJ and great, but a lot of those are are white guys. You know, there's nothing wrong with white guys. Right on, my God. <laughs> right on. But again, let's see more diversity in terms of age. We are intersectional as far as age, as far as our sexual preference. As, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm a cisgender straight woman, but, you know, why, why can't, you know, I want to see, but I have friends who are gay, I have friends who are you know, that sounds so weird to say that, like I'm, well, but I do. I mean, you know, I mean, no, we are, we are, I have this friends too, right? You know, I'm like, really, I do. I have my like, gay friends, like, oh, I'm up at your high gay friend, how are you? <laughs> you know, but you know what I mean. I mean, we're an intersectional community, and that needs to be normalized through how we're seeing and film and television and new media are one of the best ways and theater and the arts are a powerful way to do that. Absolutely. And I'm glad you, that's another great uh, Diane Elizabeth Jordan segue because um, I was going to talk about uh, in intersectionality about um, disability inclusion and other areas of 
uh, you know, where it meets other areas of civil rights, social justice. Right. Right. So be an educator for a minute and 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 tell a, a, a person who's who's listening to this in the future or watching this um, a little bit about the importance of understanding what we mean when we say intersectionality. Well, and this is you know, is recognizing that you know again the combination of your identity. So I uh, I am African American. So I know such with the African American community. I have a disability. I'm a woman who has been 29 for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that the people have been 29 for a long time community. But that's what I mean by intersectionality. I, um, you know, I'm a, I can put myself as socially progressive Christian. So as far as my, I think my values are, I don't think they're liberal. I think they're what they should be. I don't think believing in equality. For, I don't think believing in equity and equality is a liberal point of view. I mean, you know, right. That that you that's know, definitely. I mean, do, but I mean, that's just how it should be. It it is definitely um it definitely can be used as a political right. you know bludgeon. The idea of believing in you know, uh, equity and inclusion and fairness and um, and diversity, et cetera. Those, those, Can, radic those radical ideas of equity it, and inclusion, <laughs> just, you know, FBI, I'm on their top 10 one of us because I believe in equity is horrible. I'm on the, you know. Yes. Um, uh, well, thank you for, for helping me help people understand about, about the, about, you know, what our identity is. Part of what your workshop does uh, is and and other workshops, uh, you know, anti-racism training and other right. um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion type of workshops talk about understanding one's own intersections and and identities. But, um, uh, but, but I think it's also important, and you bring in the anti-racism and the whiteness workshops that I'm going to do through it and where they're coming up. But I think it's equally important to understand what you're not a part of, you know, identity that you may not be a part of, but that you want to be an ally for. So I think if, if I understand on a deep level what white supremacy is, not from my perspective, but getting another perspective, if I, you know, I want to learn, I mean, I didn't learn about the Stonewall riots until the 50th anniversary. This is a big thing. So yeah. I'm going to learn about other cultures and communities that I'm not necessarily a part of, but I'm an ally for. I mean, you know, I the same the tragedy that are going on in the Asian community right now. I, I'm not Asian, but that doesn't mean I'm not an ally. And that doesn't mean yeah, my mine is about overcoming other stigma. So that doesn't mean I'm not going to commit to being an ally of still speaking up and saying, this is wrong. So I understand from my perspective what prejudice and rhythm and uh, therefore I'm going to speak out when I see it happening in another community. So under understanding one's own identity, one's own intersections, um, mm -hmm. groups and et cetera, that one belongs with, identifies with, helps you to understand that you are different qualitatively than than somebody else's right. experience, and will potentially um, encourage you or lure you into being an ally and 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 speaking up and um, uh, and and becoming a little bit maybe a little more active I, for uh, both underrepresented communities, marginalized communities, um, and victimized communities, uh, 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 people that need advocacy, need allies, need uh, amplification. Yeah, and allies is such an important word because it's not you're taking it, you're, you're being an ally, you're saying I stand in support and I also want to say I think it's equally important for someone not to feel guilty about who they are. Sometimes, uh, like, I mean, 
Yes, Mike, you are a white guy. I look at you, you are a white guy. You have certain privileges being a white male in this country, but that's who you are. So to understand that you and I hopefully can are becoming friends with the wonderful, and we can have this wonderful friendship, but we have to understand that my experiences are different. And if you, if you can say, yeah, I, I've had my tough times too, but if you can understand that you may not be able to understand what it's like for me to walk into a store and be followed. You may have never had the experience. You may not be able to understand it. But if you can acknowledge that when we walk into that 7 Eleven or whatever, that my experience of walking in might be very different from yours. And the store clerk that might be really nice to you may treat me very differently. If you can understand that, that we can bridge that gap of acknowledging that we may have very different experiences in the same environment. Does that Absolute, make sense? Absolutely. And, and um, uh, Diana does this uh, uh, exercise in her workshop where you have a, you have a, a drawing of a plate and, and you put a piece of, you virtually put a piece of food on the plate for every privilege that you, um, uh, that you experience, that you have in, in your life so that you can understand um, how full uh, your your plate is with privilege. So there, there's a phrase that's that I I remember from a long time ago. Know your privilege, understand your privilege. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you might have had a bad day, or you might have a bad experience, or a cop might give you a speeding ticket that you didn't earn um, or something. But it wasn't because I didn't get a speeding ticket because I was a, a straight white man driving a to <laughs> right. Toyota. Uh, somebody right. else might have gotten a ticket or might have gotten beaten up or might have gotten put in jail or might have gotten killed uh, by that same cop um, because of what they look like. And right. understanding privilege and understanding um, how is the, it's the first step of being an ally. Well, it's like, I don't, I don't know if you have nephews or sons or young men in your uh, life. Nephews and nieces, yeah. Okay, cool. So... My experience of having a nephew who is almost 14 and a nephew who is 10, my experience might be different because as they get older, my worries about them are different. And that doesn't mean I paid the floor, it's just that there's a different experience loving young Black men in this country that we, and the way our society is right now and my cousins who I was just on a, a family call you know there's just a different there's this technology and not that you don't I know you love you need to let you, you hear about them so do I but we may have the different experience and what our fears for them might be sometimes does that make sense absolutely absolutely that's so so even e not just your own experience but your empathy and love for your family members and extended family members and your friends and your community means that your uh, uh, the fullness of your life and the and the and the and the richness of your experience includes the pain and the anxiety and the worry right. that extends, um, and that's that's uh, that's a critical thing for for a person wishing to engage in anti-racism and and be a good ally, uh, right. that's a good place to start to understand um, those different lived experiences. Um, we're, we're, I told you in advance that, that we were gonna run out of time. Oh um, my God. But we're gonna, we're gonna we're, I just wanna get a few more things okay. in be, before. First of all, we both, we share a peanut butter problem. We I do, I'm so like, if, if it's been like causing embarrassment, yeah. Share your first. My, like well, a, first of, since, since I was a child, my parents used and siblings used to. Say, I come from a big family, uh, and uh, everybody used to say that I would always prefer a peanut butter sandwich to whatever is on 
on the table for dinner. Right. But that didn't go away with adulthood. Um, <laughs> right. And I was telling Diana before the before we started tonight that during the pandemic, it's only gotten worse. I mean, I'll wake up and have I, you know, I have coffee, but but instead of having a normal breakfast like most people, I'll just put peanut butter on a rice cake or or peanut butter on toast or something. <laughs> and then it'll be two o'clock in the afternoon. And I'll realize that that's the only thing I've had. Anyway, um, but you have a similar I, well, I do. I mean, again, and I think again, the, the, can I? I'll be back because I have the there have roommates. So, um, you know, I eat my favorite apple go snack and the kids with peanut butter and the apples and raisins. Oh yeah, on, and yeah. that's it. And that hasn't changed. But now, literally, I will get up and make a smoothie. You know, I usually make a fruit smoothie in the morning. And then grab the jar of peanut butter and the, it goes like, right in. It goes yeah, right into the mouth. I mean, literally, I mean, I'm like going. Is that, I, is that, wait, now let me ask, is that, is that jar of peanut butter shared with the roommates? No, I have no roommates. And that's what makes it worse. I have no roommates. Oh, you don't. No oh, forgive me. Okay. Out, so I just Sorry. sent my stuffed animals, but there's another, that's another, but, you know, but they know. I just, I remember the other day, I was like, oh my God, let's did, like eat a whole jar of peanut butter in two days. I mean, it's really. Yeah, yeah. that's and, that's how it I happens. I need to go to a support group pretty soon for the game. I think, listen, yeah. I think if that's the least of our worries. Um, that's true. You, so you um, have this phrase, which I freaking fell in love with, experience. Um, exp I guess it's expression arts uh, passionata, or I, I would probably pronounce it differently in Italian, but one passion, many hats. Yeah, my passion for the art, yeah, but the art passion is that is um, because I love, I mean, I, I think one of the damaging things that we can do to ourselves as artists is how we can find success, and if we do find success as I was talking about this with Maddie Goff the other day. I think of how we grow up and we go, oh, I'm going to be a big star and this is our success. When we don't meet that, it can be really damaging. But I think if we redefine that, so for me, I do enjoy teaching. But is it teaching it, uh, the extension of who I am as an artist because I'm teaching my craft? I like editing, I like directing. I I love the arts. Um, so the, I would be depressed if I couldn't do any of it, you know. Um, and yeah, but I love to book a series. Of course, I would. Yeah. Financially, financially, it would be wonderful. You know, that it would give me a bigger platform to say the thing that I want to say. But I'm the little girl that dreamed about. <laughs> moving to LA and Chicago or in Rockford and Oak Park where I grew up, she made a dream come true and it may not have happened in the way I thought they would, but it's really amazing. So I think when I really find what success meant, I've learned my life. I've made my life a lot happier. That doesn't mean I don't have moments because I do, especially in this 2020, but when I really think about it, it's like, you know, earlier, I was like, on my family, you talk like, oh, I, I got to jump off the call, and I got an interview with Mike Rock coming out, you know. <laughs> yeah, family, I got that Mike Rock interview coming out. I was like, cool. <laughs> and I was like, I have to be back. I was like, it was awesome. Uh, well, I'm glad I could provide some. <laughs> Some yeah. legitimacy, yeah, but, you made, made but that's great. such a wonder. That's a great lesson for young uh, artistic aspirants or creative uh, people. There are many different ways as a as a creative person, as an artist, to express yourself. So, um, uh, one passion, many hats. Expression, arts, passionata. A um, yeah. couple of quick facts about Diana Elizabeth Jordan um, from Oak Park River Forest, uh, uh, a suburb of Chicago where my, um, mother is from and, uh, and I have many extended family members. Same with Ernest Hemingway, um, Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's and, uh, Thomas Lennon, who I know from my old New York comedy days. 
Um, you are. He was, a, he was the OPRF. I don't think we were there at the same time. I think he was a little bit younger than I am, but we were there around the. And I think he meant the OPRF. That's uh, oh, uh, for those for those who's taking keep me score at home. That's Oak Park River Forest High School I, outside of Chicago. Um, the, he's on the wall of fame. There's a wall of fame there, and I believe Thomas Lennon is on there. And you're and, on the wall of you're on the wall of shame. The, um, it was the, the, the um, yeah. There's like a wall of chief, and then I, I am on the wall. It, it was a pretty cool moment. That is uh, cool. Yes. And the Homer Simpson is on the wall. Oh, that's pretty. So the guy who did the voice of Homer Simpson, he was, he was there a few years before I was, but Homer Simpson, Tom Lennon, I believe, and I are on the- I thought, um, I thought you were going to be wall. on the on the Hall of Shame for the peanut butter I'm, problem. I'm probably on um, somebody's Hall of Shame somewhere. You are cousins through relatives with uh, musician Stanley Jordan. I am. He's amazing. Tom. I Look him up, him, folks. I, I, I just saw him an hour ago, actually, on our family call. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah, our, our dad, um, our dad, his father is um, deceased, died a few years ago, but his dad is my dad's older brother. So, yeah, we, we grew up. I mean. I, I love that. Yeah. And, and Hill Harper. Yeah. Uh, uh, of uh, CSI New York and the uh, Good, Good Doctor, Doctor and Covert Affairs and everything else. I auditioned once for a project that, that I don't think went forward, but I auditioned for Hill and he was so nice. And I was, the role I was playing was such a, um, like sort of obnoxious, like white newsman kind of dude. Right. <laughs> it was such a, it, and, but he was so nice uh, meeting him in that, in that. He's uh, a great guy. Now that Hill is, Hill's grandfather and my grandmother were siblings. So oh, that's cool. we're so it, so yeah so our dad was first cousin so yeah um I'm trying I'm just trying to make sure I don't leave anything out because I've got so many things about Diane Elizabeth Jordan that I wanted to explore today mm -hmm. um but I do want to say this um you have this wonderful statement um uh, in uh, I I found it I don't know where else it is but I found it I think either by either on your website or it might have been on IMDb, um, but um, Diana Elizabeth Jordan has committed her career to entertaining and ensuring disability is an in, in, uh, inclusive part of the American scene. Um, you know, not a lot of performers or creatives or you know actor, director, writer types have sort of a mission statement for their career, but you have you have a mission statement for your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do. That's amazing. Well, thank you. I mean, it, it just um, is uh, it just something I kind of felt, and you know, again, I don't think it's something you have to do. It's just something I wanted to do because. I didn't grow up seeing images of people that looked like me, and I didn't really grow up seeing a lot of images of disability. And so, in order to change that, I wanted to be one of the actors, and there are a lot of wonderful working actors out there with disability, but I might go have disability, but I wanted that to be part of my mission. Is, and I think when I show up, I get to do that. I, you know, I get to do heartbeats by Ripley Improv and I, I played a nurse. And what was really cool is that I did the research into the organization called Exception of Nurse, which are nurses who had disabilities. So I wrote them and they wrote me back. I wrote the president and as I said, I did play the nurse on this medical improv show and I, you know, with a guest star and I really, it was important for me to do a good job, you know, but then I thought, wow, as an African, I, there was an image of an African-American woman who had a disability playing the nurse. Now, so that was really cool to have that opportunity for her to say, can I post your letter on our blog? Oh, that's great. 
was really cool. I mean, because I, I mean, because I did, and I said, oh yeah. So you know, representation matters. You know, represent that you can't say it any more beautifully than that. It matters, and I am one image of disability. There are many images, but I am one. And so I, I want, but I also want to open the door for other people, which is the way I like to direct and produce and, and showcase other artists, as well as having opportunities for myself, you know. Because I don't deny, I don't deny I want stuff because I do. You had, you know, I want, I want, <laughs> I want it, but I, I want other people to have opportunities as well. Absolutely. I love that. I love I love how you put that, Diana. Thank you, Diana Elizabeth Jordan. It's just been a, such a pleasure having you on, and uh, and I'm so happy that you could join us. And I'm going to remind people that one of your favorite poems is "Mother to Son" by Langston yes. Hughes. Yes. I'm going yes. to encourage our audience to look up the Langston Hughes poem "Mother to Son," and um, and thank you again for being our guest today. Thank you. That, that poem was a favorite of both my grandmothers. Oh, so, um, yeah. That's beautiful. Is it just dianaelizabethjordan.com? What's your website? Uh, yeah, my, my website is dianaelizabethjordan.com and on Instagram and Twitter, I'm um, from the heart, D-E-J. So from the heart, D-E-J. -E -E and then um, my website is dianaelizabethjordan.com. My birthday is June 30th, If you would like to send peanut butter things. Or, to, or, flower, or, either or, or flowers. On my or birthday, flowers. On my birthday. Yeah. That's in a few months, so you can save up. And, Got plenty you know. of time. To yeah, save plenty you. of time. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, you audience, for watching us and listening. And uh, we'll see you next time or hear you. All right. Thank you.